<clears throat> so let's say your neighborhood was having a volunteer month and they decided to do renovations on every house in their neighborhood, including yours. Yay, right? Everyone is going to pitch in for that month, regardless of their skill set they brought to the table. The only thing is that you can't bring any of your own tools to fix other people's houses. You can't trade in tools to get a different one or trade with others. And a few people get the same tools, okay? This means you can only use the tool that the HOA hands to you at the beginning of that month, okay? But here's the catch. Ironically, everyone who gets a tool from the HOA becomes abnormally effective with that tool within hours. I mean, you never thought you could use a skill saw, but now you got the skills to saw. You know what I'm saying? All right. So here's the question. How important would it be that you showed up to serve that month? All things considered. Would it be very important? Yes. You guys give me some feedback. Yes, it would be right. How important would it be that you didn't leave your tool at home? Would that be important? Okay, yep. Would it make any difference in how fast and how well all the other houses get done? Would it make a difference? It would. Would it impact the overall joy or comfort of the other homeowners in your neighborhood? Yes or no? It would. Does it matter how you use the tool as long as you use the tool? Does that matter? Well, it actually does, right? Because what we're going for, show the image, Michael, of the nice home. What we're going for is, ah, everybody said, oh, that's nice. Upbuilding. Oh, that's very upbuilding. Yes, I like that. But you could actually use the tool that you're given in the wrong way, and it could look like this when you're done with it. Oh, right? You're like, I got the skills. I got the power. But... I used it selfishly and for my own glory and for my own pursuits and to showcase my ability. And I wasn't really thinking about the people that I was doing the work for, and it could look like this. Okay, that's very good. Well, this is a silly illustration, but it's kind of what spiritual gifts are like. You, you could see them like specific God-given power tools and the effectivity to use them that are given to each of God's people for the good of the church and the glory of Christ, right? I hope the illustration in some ways will help show us the value of each one in this room using their gifts towards each one in this room, right? And the gravity of actually not using your gifts. Paul would say in Corinthians that we should be eager, eager to use our spiritual gifts, right? And he says also in in Corinthians, I believe, he says, don't be ignorant of your spiritual gifts because to not use them as God intended means that God is not honored the way he wants to be and the family or the church is not built up like they need to be, right? So just a quick preview from last week, if you weren't here, we made it through an entire two verses, Okay, yeah, that was really great. So we talked about motivation, and I just want to recap this very quick because it ties into where we're going with the spiritual gifts. So specifically, we talked about how living the Christian life or obeying God or laying it all down and surrender like a living sacrifice, if you want to use any of those terms or words, we talked about how many times you can do those from just a mere duty motivation, like I have to, so I'm going to do it, right? Or you can sometimes do it in a fear motivation. If I don't surrender to God and do the right things, he's going to strike me with a lightning bolt, right? Or something like that. But Paul reminds us in Romans 12, 1 through 2, that there is a superior motivation that all Christians are supposed to have to lay down their lives in service to the Lord. And what is that superior motivation that we talked about last week? Mercy, right? You are in awe and you marvel at the mercy that has been given to you in Christ that although we are super sinful, that Christ Jesus loved us, he died to save us, 
and redeem us. And this is the beauty of what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is talking about. He says that in view of God's mercy, or we can say it another way, because of the mercy that you've received from Christ, this mega mercy from a majestic God, offer everything you have to God every day of your life. That's inwardly and outwardly until you see your Savior face to face, right? That's what we're talking about. And I mentioned having a Jean Valjean moment from Les Mis. Anybody know about Les Mis, right? So I'm talking about repeating that Jean Valjean moment every day of your life. Remember the story, Jean Valjean stole the priest's stuff and yet in an unexpected twist of mercy, the priest didn't turn Jean Valjean into the police. Listen, he pardoned him by receiving the penalty of his theft into himself. And then he spoke a declaration of righteousness over Jean Valjean that he did not deserve. And he gave him the candlesticks too. He said, you left these. In reality, he didn't leave them. He left these and he gave him that gift for himself and for him to use the candlesticks on others. And it reminds me a lot about salvation, all the grace we've received from Christ and even spiritual gifts that we are to use on others. So in Romans 12, 1 and 2, we see mercy as this life-changing motivation that inspires vertical surrender to God, right? But it doesn't stop there. Then in our text this morning, connected, Romans 12, 3 through 8, there is this wonderful connection that the vertical worship that you give to God can't help but overflowing out to the people of God. Do you see that here? So that that horizontal participation in the life of the church, that content, cont, uh, continual practice of using your spiritual gifts can't help but flow out of understanding and celebrating and trusting and loving the mercy of God that's been displayed to you in Christ, right? You want to get your feet dirty, your hands dirty. You want to get involved with other people because of what Jesus has done in you. So as we reflect on that mercy, it overflows in service to God's people. And that's the connection to the text this morning. The title of my sermon is, Use Your Spiritual Gifts. Anybody have a clue what I'm wanting you guys to do this morning? <laughs> There you go. So I want to give a quick overview of spiritual gifts before I d dive in our remaining verses from Romans 12, 3 through 8. So quick overview. It might not be quick. Who knows? We'll see. But the phrase spiritual gifts is found in Romans 1, 11. Paul wants to impart some spiritual, that's pneumatikos, gift, that's charisma, to those in Rome in order, listen, why does he want to give that spiritual gift? To strengthen them, that is, in their faith. Similar phrasing is found in 1 Corinthians 14.1 when Paul says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. That word in the Greek is pneumatikos, okay? So here's the question, and I'm going to be referring to many texts in the New Testament, but the question is, what are the spiritual gifts, okay? So there are four main places in the New Testament that list spiritual gifts, and here's the thing, none of the lists there list all the gifts. Otherwise, once we read the first list, we wouldn't read, need to read the second list, right? And most likely compiling or gathering all the lists together doesn't actually result in a complete master list of all the spiritual gifts. But this we do know. The following lists are in the Bible and they are gifts. So let's start there. And here's a, a graph that I wanna throw up for you. I don't know if you can see this, I'm sorry if you can't, but it basically takes the four main places in the New Testament where you have the gift list. That's Romans 12, six through eight, that's our text this morning. 1 Corinthians 12, eight through 10, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 30, and Ephesians 4, 11. So if you combine all the gifts in these lists, you get about 19 total gifts, okay? And I'm gonna say them really quick if you can't read them. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, faith, apostles, teaching, serving, 
administration, encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy, evangelists, pastors. And depending on how you define the gift of tongues, we already had tongues this morning and interpretations. Michael Card this morning, we heard him singing in Hebrew, and then we sang the lyrics to Psalm 121 right after that. Some of you guys weren't here, and you're like, what are you talking about, okay? Um, all right, so here's the cool thing in the, in the list. Several of the gifts are repeated, right? So prophecy actually is mentioned four times across the board, right? Teaching is mentioned three times as a gift in these separate lists. And healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and serving are mentioned two times. The other gifts are mentioned once. Next graph. That's four different ones, but it's interesting when you read 1 Peter 4, he actually seems to summarize the gifts in, under two main headings or two main categories. That's all he needed. And here are the two headings. You ready? Speaking gifts and serving gifts. You know that text? He says, and when speaking, speak the very oracles of God. And when serving, serving in what? You remember? The strength that God supplies. And so some people divide these gift lists up in two main headings. Okay, you can put that down. So there are two main camps for viewing spiritual gifts. And when, within those camps, there are extremes on both sides. Okay, so just so you know. Okay, and I'm going to tell you the two main camps and where I kind of stand and fit and me and Eric fit in that, okay? So the first camp is cessationism. Everybody say cessationism if you can. <laughs> too many C's and S's. All right, in that word, we have the word what? Cease, which means what? Stop in the name of spiritual gifts. You know what I'm saying? Sorry. So cessationism teaches that some of the gifts ceased and are no longer in operation today. Some cessationists believe that all spiritual gifts ceased with the end of the apostolic age. Less extreme versions of cessationism hold that only the sign gifts, a.k.a. healing, miracles, and tongues, have ceased. They often cite 1 Corinthians 13, then the greatest of these is love passage, you know that one, as a proof to their point, saying that it says prophecy, tongues, and knowledge will pass away when the what happens? The perfect comes. And they argue, cessationists argue that the perfect is a reference to the Bible. So that when the Bible was finished, the canon was complete, then those more, they will say, sign gifts or miraculous gifts passed away, okay? The only reason why I don't hold to that view is because if you read 1 Corinthians 13 very carefully, it doesn't seem like it's alluding to the Bible when it says when the perfect ceases, okay? Because then it goes on to say, we see dimly now as through a glass, but one day when the perfect comes, we will see what? Face to face, right? We will see face to face and we will know as what? We have been what? Known. To me, it doesn't seem like a reference to the Bible being completed and canonized. It seems like a reference to what? Yeah, but what? His second coming, eternity, right? So that's part of the reason why I don't hold to cessationism. I hold to the other camp. And again, there are extremes in both camps. You can be on one side far, you can be on another side far, or you can be in the middle, just right. <laughs> I don't know, right? But the other word or camp is called continuationism. And it's got the word what in it? Continue, which means what? Continue, you guys are paying attention, thank you. All right, so they believe that the spiritual gifts have continued since the day of Pentecost and that today's church has access to all the spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible. Those lists that I just mentioned, a lot of people don't hold to continuationism because they've seen spiritual gifts, what? Abused. And they're like, if that is what tongues or prophecy is or whatever, I don't have any part in that. Or they've seen it used like a billy club to beat people into submission or it's become like this thing for fame and attention and money. And they're like, Jesus isn't being glorified in that. But I just wanna ask you to do this. Don't throw the spiritual gift baby out with the bathwater of abuse, okay? We try not to do that in anything. We wanna be biblicist, right? 
So continuationists maintain that there is no scriptural evidence that any of the spiritual gifts are no longer in operation. There, there's no, nothing that we could point to in the Bible to say, yeah, there's a chapter verse that some of the gifts have ceased, okay? So I think me and Eric have talked about this many times. We would categorize ourselves as cautious continuationists or continuationists with a seatbelt. You know what I'm saying? And what's that seatbelt? The word of God right? Right? The word of God. So for example, if these speaking gifts that we're talking about, let's say prophecy is a speaking gift. If it's being used in a congregation or at a church, the scriptures say, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22, that those, that content coming out, it should be held up against what the scriptures say. And if it doesn't match that, what should you do with the prophecy? Throw it out, Right? What's our seatbelt in a cautious continuationist? Well, the Bible says if tongues is being used in a congregation, it can't happen unless what's, who's present? An interpreter. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 27 through 28. So what's our seatbelt? The word of God, right? Or the Bible says in the same chapter on spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, it says, let all things be done decently and in order. That's in the exercise of spiritual gifts in the gathered church. God had that rule. He wasn't like, just do whatever you want. If you feel good, just do it. No, he's like, there's a specific order and it's supposed to be decently and in order. So some of that, continuationist with a seatbelt. So what's the difference between natural gifts and spiritual gifts? That's a great question. I don't really know. So here's my stab at it. Most people say spiritual gifts differ from natural talents like musical ability, creativity, athletic prowess, computer skills. Don't forget nunchuck skills. If anybody has those this morning, natural gifts are given at birth, but spiritual gifts are given at what? The new birth, salvation, okay? But this should never minimize the importance of natural gifts being used for God's glory and the good of others as well, right? You know, like, I got saved and I got a spiritual gift. Forget all those natural things that God gave me. Forget that. I'm, those are unspiritual. They're inferior. No, you use those too, right? Here's the question. How do we get the spiritual gifts? Very simply, God hands them out as he decides. And guess what? He's got ultimate, ultimate wisdom, right? Does God know who should get what power tools? Hey, thankfully, yeah, he does, right? And he gives them out. Verse Corinthians 12, 11 says, all these are the work of the one in the same spirit. And he gives them to each one. Listen to this verse, just as he determines. So rest in that this morning. If you like, God, all you gave me at Christmas time was a gift of service. Why couldn't I got the teaching gift? And God's like, I know exactly what you need. And I know what the church needs, but not just connection fellowship. I know what the global church needs. I know your role in the global church as well. Isn't that comforting? We, we don't have to have gift envy, right? We didn't get what we thought we should, right? Because God and all of his wisdom is there. I love Ephesians 4, 8. It's a quote of Psalm 68, 18. And Paul applies this to the, the conversation on spiritual gifts what Jesus accomplished through his death, resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Spirit. And listen to what it says. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he, that's Jesus, ascended on high, that's the heaven's throne room, right? He, Jesus, led a host of captives, right, in his wake or in his train. And most people believe that's a reference to him crushing the enemies of sin and death for his people. But listen to the next verse. And he, that's Jesus, gave gifts, that's spiritual gifts, to men, men and women, that is at Pentecost, right? Jesus did it. Our resurrected Lord and Savior did it. And 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 makes me think that all believers have at least one spiritual gift. It says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. And 1 Corinthians 12, 29 through 30 makes it clear that no person has all the spiritual gifts. Well, except for Jesus, who had the spirit without measure, 
right? 1 Corinthians 12, 29 through 30, Paul shows this in a series of rhetorical questions that have the answer no when he says, are all prophets? Well, are they, Paul? Nope. Were, are all teachers? Are all work, workers of miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No, they don't. Guess what? That's why we need each other, right? It's a beautiful thing. We all need each other. So I've already alluded to it in the opening, but when do you get the gifts? I think it's at salvation, conversion, but I'm not completely sure how it all works, and I just want to be humble and honest about that. Texts like 2 Timothy 1.6 make me think that you can also get other gifts as you grow as a believer, like the older you get. What does that text talk about? It talks about Paul and Timothy praying in what, let's, what seems like Timothy's ordination service. And as Paul is praying and laying on hands on Timothy, Timothy gets a gift, a spiritual gift in that process. How are the gifts to be used? Well, they're to be used for God's glory. Listen to 1 Peter 4.11. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles, words of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies Here it is, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. So whatever your view of spiritual gifts, if your desire is not for Christ to be exalted through whatever he's given you as you serve, then you've got it backwards. Like it was like, I gotta come in here and showcase my talent and do what I want in the church. No, 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 no. It's Christ, you be glorified, right? Christ, you be put on display. And similarly, it's not just for Christ's glory, it's for the good of the church. Listen to Ephesians 4, 8, conversation and scriptures about spiritual gifts. Gifts were given for the building up of the body of Christ. Or 1 Peter 4, 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So if you come into church or mix and mingle with the church at large, the the universal church, and you're thinking, I need to come in here and do my gift and exercise my gift so that I can have a a sense of completion in my life, right? Or I, I can feel better about myself, right? Is that the right mindset to have about using your spiritual gifts? No. It's all for the glory of God, and it's all for the good of God's people. So in the end of our time or the rest of the time that we have this morning, I'm going to unpack the verses of Romans 12, verse three through eight, and walk us through it, okay? So first point, using spiritual gifts requires accuracy without elevation. And I talked about this a little bit last week. In the opening of these verses in Romans three, Paul pleads with his hearers not to think too high of themselves, but also not to think too low of themselves. But here's the question, why would Paul bring this up in a conversation regarding spiritual gifts? And what was the answer? Well, as one pastor put it, when we accept what we are not and what we cannot do as individuals, it actually opens us up to being able to rely on others in the body of Christ, right? So when he says, don't be too high in your thinking, he's saying, guess what guys, you were made for each other. You need other people. That's actually the way God designed it. If you're very content at sitting at home and watching church on on the TV, you're missing all of what God has for you, right? You're missing all of what God wants to do for you and through you. So don't be too high in your thinking. The commentator said the flip side is also true. When you are unwilling to either, uh, or ignorant, or unwilling to see what good God actually can do through you, it makes you less likely to step out and serve others as God has equipped you. So he says, don't have too low an opinion. And we've all dealt with that before, right? The woe is me mentality, I can't do anything right, I don't have any gifts, and Jesus says, yes, you do. I saved you, your personality. I saved your who you are, and I've gifted you specifically. So be used for my glory. So don't be elevated in your thoughts, be accurate in your thoughts about what God's done 
to save you and gift you. Second, using spiritual gifts requires a unity mindset in the midst of diversity. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul explains the diversity of the church by using the body metaphor. And he does this multiple times in the New Testament, but we look at it in Romans 12, four through five. Just like there is diversity in the human body, there are different limbs or parts with different functions. We see with the eye, we hold with our hands, we kick with our legs, we do something with our spleen. I don't know what we do with our spleen, but it does something, right? So it is too with the body of Christ. His church, both locally and universally, some people prophesy, some people teach, some people serve. We all don't have the same gift or function. We don't have the same personalities, temperaments, histories, abilities, that's okay. But here's Paul's point. There's so much diversity specifically in gifting, but guess what there also is amidst all that diversity? What is there? Unity, right? Unity, we are united. It's not that Paul wants us to live united, although he does. He wants us to live united because we are united. (laughs) That's a big difference, right? We just need to realize that we are united, right? So we stop focusing on making primary all the things that differentiate us or divide us, and we start focusing on and making priority all of what unites us. And that's actually in the text. And Paul mentions several things that unite us as a church. There's unity in Christ. There's unity as the body, there's unity in grace, and therefore there's unity in purpose. Let's look at a few of those. Look at verse five in chapter 12. We are united in Christ. He says, we are one body. How? In Christ. That means Christ has saved us. He's forgiven us. He's made us righteous by faith alone. And He's connected us inseparably to himself at salvation, but simultaneously when he did that, he connected us to the people of God, right? Second, we are united to fellow Christians, verse five. Though many, we are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So because we're connected to each to Christ, we are now connected to each other. And guess what? This is this really weird uncomfortable concept and westernized Christianity. And you know what it is? You're needy. And we are actually interdependent on each other. Now, breathe that in for a minute. Doesn't that make you feel weak? Yeah? Doesn't that make you feel kind of lesser than? I wanna bust our bubble. Like I do, so that we rely on Jesus and rely on the family of God. Paul is saying we are united. That means we are not to live dependent on ourselves. We are to live dependent on the body of Christ. And that's a good thing. You hear a lot of times people say, don't come in church and be a consumer. And I get what they mean by that. Because in one regard, you're not supposed to be a consumer. But in another regard, God says, the reason why I want you to gather is because you're so weak because you need each other. You need to sharpen each other. You need to bear one another's burdens. You need to feed from God's word if God's gift is somebody to teach the word of God. Does that sound like you're consuming something? You are, we are. We are actually interdependent. We're locked like a chain. We need each other. Third point, we are not just united in Christ and united to the body, but we're united in grace. Look at verse six, I love this. Paul says, having gifts that differ according to the what? You read it to me. Verse six, having gifts that differ according to the what? Grace given us. Listen to this. We have different experiences of grace that is charismata in the Greek, but we have the same experience of grace that's charis in Christ. We don't deserve saving grace, but we also don't deserve the gifts of grace, the spiritual gifts being poured out in our lives by the spirit of God for the people of God. They were handed out to us, not on the basis of our goodness, but on the basis of Christ's goodness. It magnifies the giver, right? That's what grace does. You say, oh, I got the gift and I want it. I get to be up front and teach the Bible. David gets to do that. Eric gets to do that, not because we're so great, but God is so merciful and so big and so good. And Paul will say elsewhere, even the more private parts that don't get displayed out in front in public, they're just as important as the ones that get displayed out in public. How beautiful is this? We all are needy on grace in Christ. 
Fourth and last point of unity in the midst of all the spiritual gift diversity is we're united in pur- purpose. Paul gets more into this in verse six through eight by way of implication. He doesn't say it outright, but he's talking about if you have the gift of service, guess what you need to do? You need to serve, okay? If just you are in a room by yourself, who are you gonna be serving? You, so don't do that. Go where all the people are. <laughs> Go where the believers are. And when you get there, serve them. And you're gonna have one single-minded purpose. And all Christians will share the same purpose. That is to serve the body of Christ for the glory of God, right? Third point, final point. Using spiritual gifts requires engagement with the right attitude. Chapter 12, verse seven through eight. Romans 12 through six tells us to use the gifts. That's participate, that's Put your helmet on and get on the field and play football, if you know what I'm talking about. Don't sit on the sidelines and be like, man, I love drinking this water. You know, this Gatorade's good. I don't want to get my my jersey dirty. I don't want to get stains on it, right? The idea is we aren't supposed to put the gifts up in storage or let them get dusty or rust. And I want to know this morning, who's put their gifts up in storage? That's what I want to know this morning. I'm asking a serious question. Who has put their gifts up in storage? Don't waste time thinking back to the glory days when you were serving God's people in the very specific way you wanted to if that makes you become more bitter and more disconnected with the people of God right now and here. You see what I'm saying? Just engage and use what God has given you. It reminds me of Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. The master gave some of the servants two talents and some of the servants five talents. You're like, two, that's less than five and five is more than two. So who was the better steward of the gifts? Well, guess what? The punchline at the end is, who's the better steward? The one who uses it. Doesn't matter what you got. It's dependent on if you were faithful with what the master had given you. And I love this insight. I didn't see this until this week as I was going over the text, but the insight that comes from 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. Paul tells Timothy again to fan the flame of the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hand. That's Paul speaking. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And that's interesting to hear the verse in its complete context, because usually we just take the last part of it, right? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. But actually that's connected to a verse that's related to spiritual gifts. Did you see that? And here's Paul's main point, twofold. Gifts tend, spiritual gifts tend to fade in strength when they aren't used. Does that make sense? So if that hammer or that drill is left out in the rain and not used, it's in the backyard and you quit taking it to the job site, you actually quit going to the job site. Guess what's gonna happen to that spiritual drill or spiritual hammer? It's gonna get rusty, it's gonna get weak. It's not gonna work like it's intended. Second thing observation I see from that second Timothy passage is, sometimes we don't use our gifts because we're scared or we don't have the love we need to, to use them and to operate them. I see that in the text and Paul says, no, Christian, everywhere in this room, you've actually been given a spirit, not of fear, but of power, of love and self-control. You don't have to be selfish with that gift. You don't have to have it to showcase your talents and to make you feel all puffed up. You can do it in love for the body of Christ. Salvation makes that a, a, a reality. The spirit of God makes that a possibility, right? So, What are the gifts mentioned in Romans 12, six through eight, and what advice does Paul give us for using them? Okay, so this is where it's gonna get a little complicated. Okay, there's seven in Romans 12, and we're gonna spend the majority of time on the first one because I think it's the most argued, right? So the first gift in this list is prophecy. So the question is, what is prophecy? Well, There's three main ways that I read this week, and I'm gonna just give you definitions from the people that I read on what this could be, all right? And again, I'm just gonna hold this loosely. I'm just gonna be honest. I got kind of an idea. I've got kind of a conviction of what this is, but I don't know exactly what it is, so I'm gonna give you the options, okay, and let you pray through them. So 
One of the options is prophecy is speaking the very words of God with authority equal to the Old Testament prophets and equal to the word of Scripture. And that's the one I don't hold to, only because the canon of Scripture is closed, right? And God has spoken, and his word is sufficient. And texts like 1 Thessalonians show us that God's word is sufficient, right? Second option, so I don't hold to the first one, but I'm hold to one of the other two options or a combination of the other two options. So second option, prophecy as speech that reports something that God spontaneously brings to mind or reveals to the speaker, but which is spoken in human words, not God's words. Texts like, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. In this view of prophecy, one pastor says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 tells us that we are to test prophecies when the church is assembled and hold fast to the good ones and toss out the bad ones. Prophecy must always be rejected if it contradicts the Bible. Okay, so that's the second version. A spontaneous thing that God brings to mind reveals to the speaker, but it, which is spoken in merely human words, not God's words. The third one is prophecy as a gift, very similar to preaching and teaching, okay? So that a person brings a timely and suitable word from the scriptures in the moment of need. Does that make sense? So Eric and I believe prophecy is most likely a healthy combination of two and three. And Eric helped me with this Uh, definition, which I love. Prophecy is scripture-based or faithful communication that is not necessarily future-focused, though it can be, but that provides exhortation, encouragement, consolation, and at times, conviction. And all of these are scriptural concepts. So 1 Corinthians 14, 3 through 4 says prophecy is used for the upbuilding and encouragement and consolation of the church or comfort of the church, right? So under this definition, this two and three hybrid, what might prophecy look like? Well, great question. Well, one way it might look is something that seems really supernatural or more supernatural. For example, I think it was 2018-ish, almost 19, and I was driving to church for an elder meeting when Steve Ellis and James Campbell were elders with me. And as I was going to church, I was listening to the Bible, Isaiah, on the road on that 10-minute commute. As I got closer to the end, I was just listening to the Bible play, and I had an inward sense that seemed very strong, more than audible, that Steve was going to step down from eldering in the meeting, and he was going to tell me. The interesting thing about that was there was no reason why I should have thought that. There was no previous conversation about that. Everything's going great. Everything's going good. We have great unity and mission and fellowship. But I had that sense as I was listening to the Bible before I got out. And I walked into the room, and one of the first things out of Steve's mouth was, I'm stepping down as an elder. And you know what happened to me in that moment? I said, I'm okay. (laughs) Like, I wasn't as crushed as I could have been. Like, I was very consoled, and I told Steve, I had a feeling you were going to tell me that. (laughs) Now, I think that maybe prophecy was happening at the moment. I think. I can't tell you I'm 100%, but I think it might have been, okay? And it was used for the encouragement. And guess what? Steve was very encouraged by that, which is what the text says prophecy will do. It comforted Steve. It encouraged him. He told me. Something like, man, I'm so glad that the Lord somehow revealed that to you because that's uplifting, like God's in control. God's over all these things. He's gonna take care of everybody. So maybe, maybe that's one way that prophecy could be. Another thing is slightly different. This might be prophecy too. Have you ever been in a sermon or talking to a Christian over a cup of coffee or in pot or something like that and you're facing trial or difficulty or hardship, and then as that person was speaking, you heard the exact word from God's word that you needed. Has that ever happened to you? Like you were like kind of blown away by it, right? 
it was almost like you were like, I feel like God is speaking directly to me. And it's like that word from the word got like in your, in your head or in your heart and just hung there. Like maybe for the day, for the week, for the month, and it kept on replaying and replaying. And God used that according to 1 Corinthians 14 to encourage you, to build you up in your faith, to console you when you were struggling. That might be a way prophecy is used as well. Does that make sense? So those are some options. Last, I think prophecy also has a use towards non-believers mainly, I think. And I think in a way of conviction, okay? Let me just read the text for you because the word prophecy is in it. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25. Paul says, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God. Who will worship God? The unbeliever. And declare that God is really among you. Well, this text could be pointing out that sometimes the pastor or whoever is presenting the word of God, is taught, it's mentioned, it's applied in such a way that the unbeliever feels personally called out by something and convicted. And I know that happens all the time, right? That happens for believers too. And maybe that's what Paul is getting at, but it might be something a little bit more serious than that. It's possible with the way the text is worded that when Paul says the secrets of their heart will be disclosed, that God is exposing something really particular. So the question is, what would have to come out of the pastor's mouth or another believer's mouth that would cause the non-believer mentally to think, God is speaking to me right now. He's exposing my inner secrets, maybe inner sins in this moment. I'm falling on my face in reverence and awe and humility saying, God is real. He is in this place. I need to repent and worship him alone. What has to come out of the person's mouth to make that happen? I don't know. (laughs) Paul didn't say, I'm sorry. I'm just giving you what I got in the Bible. I'm trying to be honest. But it could be something like what Spurgeon mentioned and it was accounted for in his biography. It says, you you guys know Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. He was preaching and all of a sudden, the person who was in the sermon said he broke off from the text he was preaching on, from his sermon and its subject. And he went in an entirely different direction. And he walked across the stage and he pointed into the audience and he said, young man, those gloves you are wearing have not been paid for. Can you imagine if you were in the congregation and you're like minding your own business, just going to church for a little bit to do your thing, and then whoosh, you don't even know the dude. And he's like, young man, those gloves you're wearing, why the man, I don't know, it must have been cold in there. He's got gloves on, okay? And he says this, Spurgeon says, you have stolen them from your employer. At the close of the service, the young man, looking very pale and greatly agitated, came to the room, which was used as a vestry, and begged for a private interview with Spurgeon. On being admitted, he placed the pair of gloves on the table and tearfully said, it's the first time I've robbed my master. I will never do it again. You won't expose me, sir, will you? I would ki- it would kill my mother if she heard that I had become a thief. A similar story was told by Spurgeon at the end of it, very similar. He goes to Spurgeon and He says, afterwards, the Lord met with him and he saved his soul through that interaction. That seems to be something like what's happening in 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25. I mean, I can't be crystal clear, but I'm just trying to give you what I got, okay? So prophecy, again, what do I think? I think it's a healthy combo, scripture-based, faithful communication is not necessarily future-focused, though it can be, but that provides exhortation, encouragement, consolation, and at times, conviction. Does that make you feel uncomfortable, anybody in here? Some of you guys might feel really uncomfortable about the way I describe prophecy, but some of you guys were like, yes! <laughs> okay, but whatever it is, this is, this is convicting, 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, eagerly desire or pursue the spiritual gifts. And then you know what Paul says right after that? Especially prophecy. Okay, there. All right. 
the easier ones to walk through and then we'll be done. Prophecy in the list in verse seven, Romans 12 through seven, service. People who are gifted with performing practical tasks and meeting needs and don't require to be in the spotlight. I know many of you guys have this gift. They have the ability, again, I'm reading a definition, to joyfully work along another and help that person complete the task God has given them. Spiritual gift of service. Second or third, spiritual gift gift of teaching, verse seven. I'm reading a definition. God-given ability to understand and communicate biblical truth in a clear and relevant manner so that people can faithfully understand and apply the scripture to their lives, okay? Doesn't have to be from the pulpit. The person with the gift of teaching, I believe, can also have it. So in a one-on-one setting, the people are like, man, the scripture's clear when you say it. Or in a small group, they're like, I get it. Finally, I get it. And I think they would also have the gift of teaching. Fourth in that list of seven, encouragement. I'm reading a definition. Verse eight, involves motivating, encouraging, and consoling others so that they may mature in their walk with Jesus. People with the gift are literally good at coming alongside others and spiritual support. You can think of formal counseling or friendly supportive demeanor when you see somebody at church or an encourager who speaks encouraging words when you're around them. In the last three gifts in this list, Paul uniquely tells us how to use them effectively. So I'm going to give you the gift, its definition, and from the text in Romans 12, an exhortation on how to use that gift effectively. So Fifth, the gift of of giving, verse eight. The ability to give money and other forms of wealth joyfully, this is important, wisely and generously to meet the needs of others, okay? And here's the advice on how to use the gift, and it's in Romans 12. Paul says the one who gives should give it how? Generously, but that word in the Greek is not what you may have thought it meant. It's not what I thought it meant. That word in the Greek actually means not how much you give, but from what you give, because that word means from the heart. So a person who has the spiritual gift, here's the guard. He might be warning you if you have that spiritual gift and you give large amounts to people, sometimes they might take advantage of you or be ungrateful. And he says in that moment or in those moments through the years, Don't let that temptation rob you of continuing to give fully from the heart for God's glory and for the good of others, right? Sixth spiritual gift in this text and then the advice in operating it. Leadership, verse eight, a definition. People who have a clear, significant vision from God and are able to communicate it publicly or privately in such a way that influences others to pursue that vision. Clear enough? And here's the advice in using it. It seems like Paul is warning people that sometimes when you're out front and you're leading, you don't have anyone leading you. Isn't that true? You're like always a person driving. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's take that hill for Jesus. Let's do it. And it seems like maybe he's saying you don't have that accountability so that if you get lazy on the vision, nobody's there to urge you on. And the exhortation is keep leading with zeal and passion. And maybe that's an exhortation if you have the leadership gift to keep on going back to others and get that accountability so that you can keep on leading. Last gift in this list, mercy. There's a definition from a a resource, verse eight, the capacity to feel and express unusual compassion. I love that. Sympathy for those in difficulty or crisis situations and provide them with the necessary help and support. Think of people who are poor, sick, weak, a prisoner, addicted, elderly, and the person with the gift just has, they're like a magnet. They're just drawn to them and they have that that ability to pour out mercy and compassion to meet that need. What's What's the help in exercising that gift? Well, it seems like Paul's warning people and saying sometimes when you're around people who have so much need, you might get super sad. Have you ever heard somebody say they're an empath? Maybe it's a person with this gift so that they absorb the emotions of other people. And Paul's exhortation is, hey, when you get discouraged because of all the sickness and the poverty and the hardship and the weakness and the, and the people that are hurting, just remember Jesus. Remember he's got you. Remember he loves you. Remember he's gonna give you the strength and do it cheerfully. Do it cheerfully, right? So in conclusion, a few things. What's your gift? Are you using them 
kids and adults. If you're a believer, you've got gifts and you've got natural abilities, so use them, right? Why are you using them? Let's use them for God's glory. Let's use them for the good of the church and not to put ourselves on display. And why do you need a savior in the midst of spiritual gift talk? Because we're sinful, right? Sometimes we don't want to use our gifts. We got hurt in church. Somebody said, hey, look, I love how you were doing it with VBS, but, you know, somebody else can do it better. Thanks for nothing. And we, we get hurt, don't we? And we say, you know what, maybe I'll just let somebody else do it. You know, maybe God's done with me. And some of that's legit. And it should be processed through and lamented. And sometimes we just need to realize we need a savior. He died for us. He died for that pride. He died for that self-pity that's not honoring to him. He died for that unwillingness to get in and use your gifts. And he loves you. And not only that, but we need a savior because he gives us the power to do these things that he's called us to, right? So as we conclude, I'm gonna ask you to do a weird thing for take home before we observe the Lord's Supper. And I thank you for tracking with me the whole time. I really want you to write this down if you have a pen or paper, okay? And I really, I'm pleading with you. Would you please do it with me? Would you pl- please do it with me? And would you do it for me? And I think God will be honored in it. I think if it's done right, it's done wisely and it's done carefully, okay? So here's the thing that I want you to do. I want you first to list out a list of why you're thankful, like for the specific gifts God's given you and the specific people with gifts that God's put in your life. It doesn't have to be from just this congregation. It can be from over the years, okay? So I wanna try to cultivate a spiritual uh, mindset of gratitude what God has done, what he's doing, how he's gifted. And I just want you to take some time this week and say, thank you, God. Thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for what you've done through other people with specific giftings. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Second, I want you to take at least the opportunity to speak to three people this week. Please, would you do three people, okay? Only one of them can be within your household, okay? Only one. And the other two One can be in our church and one can be a part of the church universal, okay? That's just, I'm not trying to be legalistic on it, it, whatever you want really, but I'd like you to try to do that. One in your home, one a part of this local fellowship, and one, you know, in the the broader church. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to talk to them this week. I'd love for you to, to, to talk to them in person, but you can't call them or text them. And I want you to say, hey, and it might not be on this list, our list from this morning, the spiritual gifts or any of the other lists, but I want you to say something like, I see Jesus using you in this way. And if you can think of the specific natural gift or the spiritual gift, say that. Man, when God uses you in my life and others' lives, I see his beauty and his mercy and compassion on display and meeting needs. I see his giving heart. When you give, I see God's giving heart. When you serve, I see the serving God. When you speak, I I hear God's wisdom through you. And I just wanna give God glory through that. Could you do that with me? That's what I'm asking. What do you think would happen if we did that this week? Cultivating the, the thankful heart, but also go out and just tell a few people what God's doing. What do you think would happen? What do y'all think? What happened? Seriously. God would be glorified. What else? The church would keep on going. Wouldn't that motivate you if this week you got a word from somebody else and you're like, the Lord's using me? That's so encouraging. And it can't be me. So don't, don't tell me. Or don't tell me. You can tell Eric, but don't tell me. All right? All right, let's pray and then we're gonna observe the Lord's Supper. Jesus, you're such an amazing God. Thank you for... The help this morning, even though I felt a little uh, like a pinball bouncing around in a pinball machine, I pray that you would use uh, your word to give us faithfulness, Lord. I just humbly confess, and I confess this to you this week, Lord, I don't understand all the spiritual gift stuff. There's so much for me to learn. Lord, I want to be corrected if there's anything that I misunderstood in the word this morning. God, but I, I want to understand what you've given us, and so help us to have right views And I pray in the mindset of like John 17, Lord, if there's a church down the street who exercises uh, a certain view on a gift 
as long as it's within the biblical framework. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't have a heart that's divisive to put them down and say, you're not where we are and what we believe, even if it's a cessationist, Lord, or a continuationist. But Lord, as long as they function within biblical framework, Lord, I pray that we would pursue unity and we want God's blessing in their their life and their ministries, Lord, I, I pray that. So Lord, help us to have humility. Lord, help us to desire the spiritual gifts, not ultimately for ourselves, but for the glory of your name and the good of your church. And as we take this homework home, I pray it wouldn't be something that has to be done or we feel burdened by, but it would be freeing, it would be exciting, and it would cultivate, Lord, just an encouragement so people could keep on going with what God's given them to do. I pray this for your glory, Jesus. Amen.